I've gotten a ton of requests on this. Today we're going to be looking at another one of Styropyro's videos. Specifically, this relatively new one on 100 car batteries wired in parallel. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. Do you ever wake up in the morning and ask yourself, what happens when you wire a hundred car batteries in parallel? <laughs> I can't say that I did. <laughs> if so, you're in luck because that's exactly- <laughs> That pose. <laughs> Just laying across them. I'll be doing today. By wiring all these in parallel, the voltage is going to be the same as a single battery, which is just a bit over 12 volts. Now I realize this seems lame compared to what I usually show on this channel, but you see, this isn't a video about high voltage. Oh no, we're playing with fire today. See that rating right there? That's how much current this battery can deliver for 30 seconds. I'm gonna say it's the current, not the voltage when it comes to this DC stuff. <laughs> in freezing temps, and that's 850 amps. So, by wiring a hundred of these in parallel, we're looking at 85,000 amps. Of course. Yeah, uh... <laughs> so shock hazard, meh. Arc flash uh, hazard, whoa. <laughs> Cable and contact resistance is going to limit that somewhat, but I'm curious to see just how ridiculously high the current can get here. This sort of arrangement kind of reminds me of the uh, battery rooms for uninterruptible power supplies at the nuclear power plant, though there's one key difference. What you're seeing here is just one battery and a whole bunch of cells compared to Styropyro putting a hundred batteries together. What these batteries do for us is they're for operations of what we call our critical switch gear. So these batteries are control power that enables us to switch the really big loads on the uh, switch gear for safety related pumps, HVAC systems, basically everything we need to uh, safely shut down the uh, nuclear power plant and keep the core cooled and covered in an accident scenario. This is also essential to us during a black start of the station Basically, the Fukushima scenario where we lose all AC power from the grid and we have to restart everything up using a combination of these batteries and our emergency diesel generators. One thing I will say for Styropyro's experiment, really glad he's doing this outside. <laughs> Most uh, issues you can have with battery rooms could be with uh, HVAC improperly uh, venting the uh, the batteries. Some types of these batteries can actually give off hydrogen if they're overcharged and it can accumulate, which hydrogen is explosive, which is why you want to keep the, the area well ventilated when working with a lot of batteries. Doing it outside, there's a reason for it, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to produce thousands of amps for a tiny fraction of a second. <laughs> but what does it look like when you make even more than that over a few seconds? In fact, I'm hoping to achieve the current seen in a lightning strike with these batteries. The most daunting engineering task for this- Lightning current is about 30,000 amps, by the way. It's a lot. It was coming up with a way to switch these massive currents, particularly one that can- <laughs> Just looking at this, just seems completely insane. It's like, I don't want to stand anywhere near that thing. <laughs> ...circuit when tens of thousands of amps are flowing through it. I settled on modifying a log splitter, mostly because it can rip apart contacts that weld themselves together. Now the best part about this switch is that you load it like a crossbow. So let me show you this beautiful mechanism here. Dude. So you gotta yank this back while feeding this pin. It's not very easy. Uh, let me just show you. Okay. I never thought I would ask myself the question, what is the draw rate of 100 car batteries? So now it's loaded. <laughs> feed this actuator so it can yank out that pin. Uh, let me just show you. You can see the actuator there that yanks out that pin. So now, when I hit this yeet switch... <laughs> the yeet switch. <laughs> contacts slam together. And then if I have some catastrophic failure and need to kill power, I just press this frick button here to rip apart those plates. That is the best remote I've ever seen. <laughs> yeet and frick. <laughs> oh, and I also have to yank the string at the same time. Oh. Seems safe enough, right? 
<laughs> Does it? <laughs> now, I don't want to bore you with numbers, but I feel like it's important to give you a sense of the crazy scale that I'm dealing with here. That bank holds an incredible 320 megajoules of energy. That means that if one of those batteries fails short, the uh, energy equivalent of 500 cars screaming down the highway would get dumped into it all at once. I was going to say, how many kilograms of TNT is that? <laughs> at least a few. <laughs> a few dozen? Something like that? <laughs> Which would probably make a sizable crater. I really hope that doesn't happen. Now I could go on and on about how clinically insane this is. <laughs> I love this pose. This, uh, this leaning over it and we're going to see next the draw me like one of your French girls pose. <laughs> I should let the rest of the video do the talking here. I will say that you definitely shouldn't play with car batteries. I mean, even one can mess you up if you abuse it enough. So True. yeah, don't try this at home. For the first test, I'm going to try a piece of quarter inch threaded steel rod. This should be easy to melt, but the small size will probably limit the current somewhat. Here we go. Yeah, just a, f a few little sparks. <laughs> it looks like the connection broke there. I mean, it is only 12 volts, so nearly anything can break the circuit here. Yeah. I went ahead and smacked the threads with a hammer a bit to hopefully give more area of contact. Here we go. Ooh. It was slower than I hoped, but I did like the green flames from the zinc plating burning off. Here I have a 3 8 inch threaded rod. Now this has over double the area of the last rod, so it should pass quite a bit more current. Here we go! Look at that! Wow! <laughs> cool! I, I think that one was just as fast, if not faster! Let's try zapping some ferrocerium. Now this is the metal alloy that makes that modern lighter flux. Oh, here we go. And it makes a bunch of sparks when it's ground down. I'm hoping it makes even more sparks with these batteries. Here we go. <laughs> Little cluster sparkler. <laughs> it just exploded. Maybe a bigger rod will give even more sparks. There we go. I'll take that as a yes. Unfortunately, it didn't actually burn all the way through there. Gosh, it's just so hard to keep contact with the voltage being so low. You might just need more weight. This is a kilogram ingot of bismuth metal. It's super dense and melty, so I'm hoping it will keep enough <laughs> contact melty? to melt all the way through. Alright, here we go. Well, that was messy. It splattered molten metal all over the place, although a lot of Dislodged it wasn't itself. melted. It still made a nice puddle though. Plus, the oxide layer on the remaining ingot is super colorful. I want to try zapping this half inch bolt, but this time I'm going to measure the current through it by looking at the voltage drop across the cables. Here we go. It took a while for it to secure contact, but once it did, it melted pretty quickly. That's the cool. The oscillogram is noisy, but once it made full contact, there was a drop of about 180 millivolts there. Now this is across a mere 16 millionths of an ohm, which means the current there was about 11,000 amps. Yeah, I was going to say voltage equals current squared times resistance, so a lot of current. It's also the same principle how... Uh, Systems like heat trace works, just that I squared R heating keeps your pipes from freezing. Not bad. Let's give this saw blade a try. It's nice and flat and conductive. It should pass a substantial amount of current. Fire in the hole. <laughs> it certainly burned through quickly, but I was hoping it would explode or something. Oh well. The current there was higher, a peak of 15,000 amps. Now that's probably near the limit without making some modifications to the circuit. Now if I can do 15 kiloamps for a few seconds, now that would be pretty crazy. And it might be possible with this three quarter inch bolt here. Here we go. Whoa. You know, 
For as easy as it is for wires to short when you don't want them to, it's been bafflingly difficult to hold a short across these batteries. <laughs> Everything just keeps blowing out of place. Uh, low voltage problems, right? <laughs> I've tried using all sorts of clamps and different materials, but the results are all the same. Everything breaks contact. So this bank is scary. However, its voltage is not. And that's why I can do this and not feel anything. And besides, at only 15,000 amps, I haven't even hit the current of the average lightning strike yet. There you go. Are you telling me some clouds can have than 100 car batteries? <laughs> so, is it time to throw all these batteries in the ocean? Nope, not yet. I think using a higher voltage will overcome these problems. So I rewired the bank for a series parallel arrangement. Okay. Now yeah. there are chains of five batteries in series, then all of those are wired in parallel. This makes the fully charged bank sit at a little over 60 volts. Let's start the 60 volt experiments with another 3 8 inch steel rod. Here we go. There we go. Holy heck, <laughs> that exploded. The slow-mo shows something astonishing here. The rod heated so quickly that its zinc coating boiled off faster than it could burn. And then when the rod finally exploded- oh, Look at that! Ah, oh, that is so cool to see on slow-mo. <laughs> It left a cloud of greenish plasma as the zinc vapor reacted with the oxygen in the air. Comparing this to what happened at 12 volts, it's clear there's substantially more current at 60 volts. Sure enough, I clocked a peak of 30,000 amps, wow. which so happens to be the current of the average lightning strike. I still think I can do better though. Let's see what happens when I try a half inch bolt. Huh. I guess those little clamps weren't enough. I've upgraded to some big boy clamps this time, so hopefully this does the job. Damn it. I'll take that as a no. Yeah, that bolt really does not want to stay in those blocks. In fact, let's take a look here. Yeah, look at that. It just leaves like a big crater of splattering molten steel and copper. I wanted to jump out of there. Wow. Let's see if quad clamping it will hold it in place. Kinda. Heck. This was easier at 12 volts. What's going on here? Slow-mo shows the increased current has introduced a new problem. These blocks are getting ripped apart by the gayest force field in physics, the magnetic field. Mm. Now what's so gay about magnets? It turns out, opposites don't always attract like you might think. Yeah. I, okay, I was wondering where he was going with that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when you consider magnetic dipoles, north attracts south and vice versa. However, if you look at currents that give rise to those fields, you'll see the reverse happens to them. Opposite currents repel and like currents attract. Now this has a lot of interesting consequences in physics. It's why lightning pinches itself into a fine streamer. And it's also the basis of experimental Z-pinch fusion reactors. We're going to see Styro Pyro make a Z-pinch fusion reactor. Or maybe he's already done it and I haven't seen that video yet. But anyway, Z-pinch fusion, you use powerful magnetic fields, just like he says, to compress the uh, cylindrical plasma, the ionized gas of hydrogen, usually deuterium and tritium. And then you run a lot of current into it, kind of like in lightning. <laughs> and that magnetic field pinches the plasma, compressing it to extremely high temperatures. And by extremely high, we're in the upper hundred millions or into single digit billions of degrees Celsius. It also creates enough pressure, which, hey, that's, that's two of the things you need for fusion right there. Temperature, pressure. The third thing you need is confinement time, which is why you have this structure built around it. And that compression triggers fusion reactions between the, uh, hydrogen isotopes, the uh, deuterium and tritium, and it releases a whole bunch of energy. Like any fusion reactor though, the challenges you run into are maintaining the plasma stability under those high temperatures and pressions, and also maintaining your, your confinement time. But hey, this is another potential opportunity there for a clean and abundant source of energy with nuclear fusion. In an attempt to fix this issue, I brought in two of the leading experts in crackhead engineering, <laughs> Alan Pan in the backyard. Man, I hope that's a real genre of engineering. 
scientist. So you can see I've already tried blowing this thing up before, but like the current is so gigantic and the magnetic field is God. so huge that like it doesn't want to stay on the block. Yeah. Yeah. I want to. I want to see what this. Does. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, like you may not be safe, but like we'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it. These are that's like an inch thick. Cover. Oh yeah, it's literally an inch thick. <laughs> We're gonna take this bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I like the comparison that Styropyro is on a whole other level of mad science craziness compared to these other two guys who are also their own sort of mad science craziness. It's fun seeing these guys together. We tried sticking a can upright with the hope that it would act like a rocket. It turns out this worked just a little too well. <laughs> These fireballs were cool and all, but they also had the function of clearing out some of that annoying grass out in front of the batteries. <laughs> I went ahead and mounted everything to a big block of wood. Now let's try another half inch bolt. Here we go. Yes. Wow. It's stuck. It just exploded off of there. Wow. That's terrifying. Wow, look at the remnants of that bolt there. Nothing. You're just, you're welded on there. Wow, it looks like it took about a quarter of a second for that to melt through. And yeah, it peaked at over 40,000 amps. Wow. <laughs> Mounted destructive force that cause is always fascinating. I mean, it comes up in whenever we have our NFPA 70E refresher training on arc flash and this might be a good video to go along with that, just if you want to see what amps can do. That is insane. The slow-mo shows two powerful magnetic effects here. There are the cables in back violently pinching themselves into a bundle, and also, there's the broken bolt fragment getting launched outward due to the magnetic forces on it. There's that uh, bismuth ingot that I couldn't melt earlier. Here we go. What? Smaller. Huh, I thought its own weight would be enough to hold it down, but clearly not. So I've used these spring clamps to hold it down now. Here we go. Whoa! <laughs> Holy sh heck. <laughs> nice a edit. Huge mushroom cloud. There's not much of this thing left. It is splattered and vaporized all over the place. Wow. You know how in like, they show uh, nuclear explosions and like, some of the Fallout games making those little mini mushroom clouds? Well, you can, this, this produced somewhat of a, of a smaller one. So yeah, high, uh, high current, high temperatures, concentrated area. That was something. <laughs> At this point in the video, pretty much all the footage is terrifying. But even so, this is probably the scariest shot so far. The batteries managed to take nearly an entire kilogram of metal wow. and turn it into a cloud of vapor and liquid in a second. The drop. Look at that night. Almost looks like you're traveling through space or something with all these stars coming right at you, and that is just fascinating. It's being shot out are so hot that they're burning in air, leaving little yeah. trails of smoke while raining burning molten metal on everything around it. <laughs> Afterwards, I found bits of metal splattered on the trees, the sides of my shop, and even the table I was hiding behind. The impressive pyrotechnic display of the bismuth convinced me to try a stick of titanium as well. Titanium is used in fireworks for making bright white sparks. And it turns oh. out, it makes these beautiful sparks when being zapped by a hundred car batteries as well. Who would have guessed? In engineering, there's something called a crowbar circuit. <laughs> it's used to prevent an overvoltage from killing the rest of the device. Now, it got its name because it shorts the power supply, much like if you were to take a crowbar and throw it across the power rails. Mm. Now, I think it'd be fun to try the literal interpretation. I've actually never heard of this one. Let's see what he does. Interpretation of this circuit. I decided to start with a smaller crowbar here first. Here we go. Dude. What? That's insane. Holy sh 
Heck. That like came all the way back here. I had to dodge it. This one gave a- Might need a bigger table or a further away self distance for something like that. Really cool oscillating effect as the crowbar kept breaking and then regaining contact, which made the resulting explosions especially violent. Wow. I threw in the bigger crowbar and this one burned- It's like it, it struggled, but it kept- The more it struggled, the more violent the explosions got. That's- Or even faster. Caught fire. Oh wow, that the head of that crowbar. Oh my gosh, I just stepped on that and about burned through my shoe. <laughs> Dude. Jeez. Oh yeah, that's hot. Where's the leak, ma'am? Let's start with a small one. All right, here we go. Don't know if wrench circuit's a thing. Not as much. This big one should be nice and scary. <laughs> there we go. It's a little more. That one got real toasty. Look how, look how welded that thing is on there. Right here I have the biggest bolt that I could find at the hardware store. <laughs> An inch in diameter and 10 inches long. I think this should be fun to zap with the car batteries. This is going to be crazy. I hope those clamps survive. Whoa. Melts all the way through. So it uh, it just melted the steel around the threads there. That's that's crazy. I didn't see that happen with the uh, smaller bolts. So that's what kept it from melting all the way through. It's just it's just floating in the middle. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna try it with the uh, without the nut, just the bare bolt in there. And here we go. A lot of yellow on that one. so loud I don't even know what exploded there <laughs> it was the fuses that blew look at that they melted straight through whoa <laughs> wow that drew over 45,000 amps dude and it did it for over a second well at least before they had the fuses exploded you're probably wondering how well this battery bank works as a plasma cutter <laughs> well, I am too honestly there's only one way to find out Dude. <laughs> what? <laughs> that microwave never stood a chance. He goes through so many microwaves on this show. Wow. That works even better than I expected. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the ground connection melted there. So now I just have it sitting on that copper block. Let's give that another go. Let's try that with some steel that's a bit thicker. Oh, jeez. Ah. Come on. All right, let's try that again. I just want to cut it in half. Wow. Wow. That was wild. Got a, uh, got a few sparks in my head there. <laughs> wow. That was fun. <laughs> it's on fire. <laughs> I've sprinkled some magnetite there inside that loop of wire. That way you can visualize the magnetic field. There we Wow. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it really sticks to those cables. Look at that! I zapped some magnesium, but the results weren't that impressive, relatively speaking. It melted too easily near the contact mm. points and prevented burn through. So, I decided to try manually keeping contact. Oh, <laughs> Close range fireworks. Oh 
Only Styropyro would do this. <laughs> Where's my science machete? Science machete? Dude! <laughs> oh, that's fun. I think titanium should be even more impressive since it has such a high melting point. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that's big! Look at all that flash! Did you say what the arc rating is on his, uh, on his jacket? And that's how to light the entire yard on fire. <laughs> I love it. All right, the titanium flamethrower. Whoa. Uh, yes, I got it. <laughs> Just trying to catch on, yeah. Ooh, green. Got it, I got it. Green. Oh, nice. Before light bulbs were a thing, there was something called a carbon arc lamp that was pretty much just an electric candle. Well, I want to try making one with my batteries. I've connected a couple chonky graphite rods to the cable. I'm going to try initiating an arc by tapping them together. That noise! <laughs> I've got a fresh new one inch bolt in there. Hopefully this time will be the charm. Here we go. <laughs> yes! Oh, it melted. Oh, look at that. It finally burned through. Oh, molten. Wow! There's so much heat coming off of that right now. The uh, the radiation coming off of that bolt uh, let that wood on fire. That's a lot for... Now, of course, he's talking thermal radiation. Heat from that sufficient enough to cause fire. But when you're dealing with that amount of amps, that amount of temperature and heat input, then that's what'll get you there. Wow. That thing got hot. <laughs> I clocked a peak of just a hair under 50,000 amps there. Dude. That's quite a bit more than the average lightning strike, and for a much longer duration, too. Total circuit power there was on the order of 3 megawatts. There you go. 3 megawatts with car batteries. That's impressive. That were harnessed precisely. Yeah, that'll power a reactor coolant pump. <laughs> you should not be measuring anything in mega for a YouTube video drink. <laughs> oh, no, I, th I think it's pretty cool. The engineering for this project was deceivingly complicated. Oh, he brought his little My channel cat. has a history of circuits that operate much more complex than the schematic would lead you to believe. And this one takes the cake for that. I mean, it's basically the first circuit you had seen in Electronics 101. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Just a bait. It's as simple as you can get. <laughs> but what he did with it was amazing. Just a battery, switch, and resistor. Now, of course, there's a, there's a lot more resistances in reality. The uh, cables have a resistance, the switch has a resistance, there's contact resistance. Even the batteries themselves have an internal resistance. Everything's got resistance, unless you're dealing with a superconductor. Now, none of this is easy to measure without just building the whole circuit and putting a huge amount of current through it. If you want to see something that involves no resistance, I um, highly recommend you check out my reaction to uh, Niall Red's videos when he made a superconductor. That also has applications for nuclear fusion, by the way. That was crazy. Thanks so much for the recommendation. Every one of your recommendations seem to be getting crazier and crazier, and I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.